السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والصلاة والسلام على سيد محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا ولا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم الحمد لله من الله سبحانه وتعالى إن شاء الله bless this gathering and give us the angelic presence إن شاء الله and keep our hearts united I إن شاء الله we'll talk about a few things the, um, one of them is a, about a hadith that is related from Sayyidina Omar. And there are many versions of this hadith. This is one particular one, but the meaning of this hadith is articulated in several different ways. The Prophet ﷺ said, سَيُصِيبُ أُمَّتِي فِي آخِرِ الزَّمَانِ بَلَاءٌ شَدِيدٌ لا ينجو منه إلا رجل عرف دينه وجاهد عليه بقلبه وبلسانه فذلك الذي سبقت له السوابق ورجل عرف دين الله فصدق به. So the, the, the gist of this hadith is that there would be towards the latter time as the difficulties of the end of time begin to manifest. And we're seeing these, and so we have to be aware of them because we tend to forget sometimes that one-fourth of our religion according to the hadith of Jibreel السلام, are the signs of the latter days. This is one-fourth because the Jibreel السلام, asked the Prophet السلام, about Iman, about Islam, Iman, and Ihsan, and then he asked him about the signs of the latter days. And at the end of the hadith, he asked Omar, Atadri man as sail Do you know who, who the questioner is? And he said, Allah wa Rasulu A'lam, Allah and His Messenger know better. And he said, Inna hadha Jibreel atakum yu'allimukum deenukum. This is Jibreel who's come to teach you your religion. And so the ulama took from that that there are these four dimensions to Islam. It's a, it's and each of these dimensions is, is important. And traditionally, the signs of the end of time were part of the religion to understand. Now we're living in a particularly difficult time in many areas of the Muslim world. And if people aren't aware of the difficulties and the tribulations that come with being in the world, sometimes this can affect their iman. So it's very important that we keep in our understanding, we keep this in mind and not forget this. The Prophet ﷺ said that there would be great difficulties. One of the things that he said, he, he said, "Inna hadi umma, o ummati ummatum marhuma." My umma is a umma. It's a community that has the mercy of God on it. It's a marhuma. And then he said, "Ju'ila adabuha fi dunyaha." The the difficulties of this umma, the chastisement of this umma, is in this world. Al fitan, wal balaya, was zalazil. Social strife, tribulations, calamities, and earthquakes. I mean, it's very interesting that when you, when you hear about earthquakes generally in the Muslim world, our earthquakes are huge earthquakes. And they, they caught a lot of people die in Muslim earthquake. If you look at, like here they have an earthquake and two people die. Seriously, we have earthquakes here, two people die. You have an earthquake in the Muslim world and you're looking at literally unbelievable numbers sometimes. This, there's a divine aspect to this that these are shuhada. Allah is taking them as shuhada because the, 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 the one who dies having his house fall on him according to the hadith is shaheed. So we have a different world view and we have to incorporate this world view constantly in how we view things that we believe that we live in a benevolent universe. We believe in Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim. All of the Quranic uh, surahs begin with Bismillah Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim. And so we believe that Allah is Rahmah and that He sent His Prophet as a Rahmah. وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَاكَ إِلَّا رَحْمَةً لِلْعَالَمِينَ We sent you as a mercy to all the world. We believe He was a mercy to the Christians. He was a mercy to the Jews. He was a mercy to the trees and the forests and the animals. There is a story of Uqba bin Nafi' when he arrived to Qayrawan. And this is Thabit in our tradition. It's considered a sound story. In fact, Muawiyah actually ascertained 
the truth of this by gathering several witnesses, it's considered a karama mutawatira. It is considered a miracle that's agreed upon and we tend to forget that we believe in miracles. There's a lot of Muslims now that don't want to believe in miracles. They say, Ya Akhi, the miracle of Islam is the Qur'an. That's one miracle of Islam. But don't forget, there are many miracles and miracles continue on. They continue on at karamat. This is what uh, Imam al laqqani says in the Jawhara, that we assert miracles and anyone that rejects them, we reject him. The miracles of the awliya, the people that are close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Uqba bin Nafi', they needed a forest to build Qairawan, the city of Qairawan in the great uh, state of Tunis. He called out as loud as he could, Ayyuhal Hayawanat, Nahtaju ila al Ghaba, Munistadinukum. He said, Oh, you animals, we need this forest for our needs here, and we're asking your permission. The people that were in his army said for three days they saw the animals migrating from that forest. People don't believe these things anymore. Wallahi, I believe them. I have no problem with them at all. Because these people were amazing people. And don't think, don't think Christianity spread without miracles. Judaism spread without miracles. All religions in their formative period have a lot of miracles. That's how they get people to follow them. And then once it gets established, it's established. But people believe in these things. So the Prophet ﷺ, when he said this, that there would be tribulations, and he mentioned these earthquakes. We have major earthquakes. We have major calamities in Syria right now. You look at what's happening in Syria. And I want to remind the Syrians because every Syrian I meet now, they say to me, why aren't any, why isn't anybody doing anything? This is fart. Muslims have to do something. And, and they're 100% right. But I want to say to my Syrian brothers and sisters, welcome to a well-established club. You have membership in a, a club that has other members and they have made the same claims and the same observances. You're in the club of the Darfurians. You're in the club of the Palestinians. You're in the club of the Kashmiris. You're in the club of the Chechnyans. You're in the club of the Iraqis. Really, we have tribulations in many of these places and people have been Ignoring these things. This is why we get more and more tribulations. Because we ignore these existing things and more come. We live in a world that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has promised us that unless we are directed towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He will do everything to redirect us. If we're not directed towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He will redirect us towards Himself. Because this is why we were created. We were not created for 401k plans. You were not created for 56 inch television sets with Netflix to watch movies until you drop dead. You were not created, I'm serious, you were not created to play solitaire on your computer. That's not the purpose of all of this technology. You were created to know your Lord. You were created to study. You were created to delve deeply into the meaning of your very existence in whatever capacity you have because different peoples have different capacities. So the Prophet ﷺ told us that there will be tribulations and we should be aware of this. He told us that towards the end of time you will see the, the, the people, the ala, ri'asha yata'awaluna fil bunyan. He said there will be poor people who were uh, the desert people and they were poor and they were taking care of goats and and animals, and then they'll begin to build huge buildings. These are signs before your very eyes. You, we're seeing signs of our Prophet ﷺ. He told us that you will see the, the buildings of Mecca reach the mountaintops. The buildings of Mecca will reach the mountaintops. And this is happening in our lifetime. When I first went to Mecca, there were no buildings even close to the tops of the mountains of Mecca. And now it's filled with buildings that are beginning to reach the mountaintops. I was on one of the tallest mountains in Mecca, and you can see the clock tower now surpasses the mountains. The Prophet ﷺ said, 
in, in a hadith, he said, إِذَا رَأَيْتُمْ مَكَّةً بُعِجَتْ كَضَائِمًا If you see Mecca, if you see its mountains with holes pierced through them, this is what it means. بُعِجَتْ كَضَائِمًا وَيَتَسَاوَ بُنْيَانُهَا رُؤُسَ جِبَارِهَا And you see the buildings reach the, or in a riwayah ta'lu, they will actually surpass the mountaintops. And then he said, فَقَدْ أَظَلَّتَ السَّاعَةُ It means that the sa'a has cast its shadow. Imam Asyuti says in this, هِيَ عِبَارَةٌ عَنْ دُنُوَ السَّاعَةُ It means that the, the hour is near, it's coming close. But if you took that literally, and in hadith tradition, in the usuli tradition, أَصُرُ الْكَلَامِ الْحَقِيقَةُ That if the Prophet says something, you should always interpret it literally, unless there's a reason to go to a metaphorical interpretation. Now we have the clock tower casting a shadow over the Kaaba. So the clock tower, what do they call it in Saudi Arabia? As Sa'a. Laqad Awalata Sa'atu. You could take it literally, the clock has cast its shadow over the Kaaba. Literally or metaphorically, Iqtarabata Sa'atu and Shak al Qamar. The hour is drawing near. All of our lives are dissipating. There's three sa'at according to our ulama. When we speak about the end of time, there are three ends of time. The first one is the end of your life. The first one is the end of your life. Five minutes left? I just started. It's too depressing for people. He's like, man, we don't need to hear this. This is Minna. This isn't Isna. We're the young people. <laughs> we need some hope. <laughs> Keep hope alive. I'm going to get to the hopeful part. <laughs> Five minutes? Really? Really? Six? Thank you. Okay. So... Where was I? You guys interrupted me. The sa'a, Allahu Akbar. What time is it? Come sa'a. The Arabs say, come sa'a. What time is it? It's 7.32. They used to ask Yogi Berra. You know Yogi Berra is a baseball player. They say, what time is it? You mean, you mean now? Because you can never ask what time it is because it's always moving along. Right? So if you say, what time is it? Well, when you asked, it was this time, but now it's... You can't, that's the nature of time. You can't, you can't grab it. There's three sa'at. The first one is your life. Your life will come to an end. We all have terminal lives. They come to an end. The second one is a generation. Right now we're having a generation disappear. For instance, Holocaust survivors. This is a generation of people that experience something. They have tattoos on their arms, many of them. And, the, and they're living testimonies to a historical event that happened that most of us weren't alive when it happened. That generation is dying out. They'll be gone in a very short time. So there are no more eyewitnesses to that event. The World War II generation is dying out. They're gone. Just like now, there's no Confederate war veterans anymore. There's probably, I think the last World War I veteran died in, uh, in England recently. So a generation will die. And then finally you have the ultimate end, which is when all of this is closed down. But we have a ways to go, and I want to emphasize this. And that's why young people don't be bothered. But even if we didn't, the Prophet ﷺ said, if the end of time comes and you find yourself planting a seedling, if you're able to before the, the, the actual end comes, finish planting. So we never give up. Because you would rather meet your Lord having planted something and done something positive than meet Him without having done that deed. We're always looking towards our Lord. We don't look necessarily at the fruits in this world. Like the, the, the Khalifa, the Caliph that passed by the old man who was planting Zaytuna trees. And everybody knows the olive tree takes a long time to mature till you get olives. And he said, لماذا تزرع الزيتون لا تأكلوا منها why are you doing this zaytun? You're not going to eat from it. He said, Zara'u fa akalna fa nazra'u hatta ya'kulu. They planted those before us and we ate from what they planted, so we must plant for those who come after us. This is a vision of, of, of what we're supposed to be doing. Our lives are temporal, but we have to see that we're torch bearers. That was a topic yesterday of passing on the torch. Just like you have a, a there's a certain type of marathon race. If you, if people who know track, there's a baton and you hand the baton to the next runner. These relay races, right? I ran that in high school. 
and you have to learn how to get the baton and 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 take the baton and move and you're the next person because you have energy that person he's worn out take it i can't take any more so you grab it and you carry it as far as you can you expend all your energy and then you hand it on to the next group this is the nature of our lives on earth we're carrying the baton for a short time but we have to think about handing it to the next group of people and we have all these young people and I like Imam Al-Qasim said something beautiful one day in Toronto it had an effect on me he said to the young people if anybody tells you you're the future say no I'm the present I'm the present you have things to do right now you have things to do right now and you should do them to the best of your ability but I want you to be aware all of these tribulations and all of these calamities that are happening don't worry we have to struggle to make it better, to do whatever we can in our power, but don't worry. Al-aqibatu lil muttaqeen. The end affair is for the people of taqwa. Our, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَلَا تَكُوا فِي Don't get constricted about their plots. Don't get constricted about all of the things that they're doing against you. And then he says, if you have taqwa and if you're patient, Allah is with you. If you don't have taqwa and you don't have patience, then he leaves you to yourself. So we need to practice piety. We need to practice patience. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave you a complete minhaj in the Quran. Inna al-Muslimina wal Muslimat, wal Mu'minina wal Mu'minat, wal Qanitina wal Qanitat, wal Sadiqina wal Sadiqat, wal Sabirina wal Sabirat, wal Khaji'ina wal Khaji'at, wal Mutasaddiqina wal Mutasaddiqat. والصائمين والصائمات والحافظين فروجهم والحافظات والذاكرين الله كثيرا والذاكرات أعد الله لهم مغفرة وأجرا عظيما الله سبحانه وتعالى says those who are people in a state of submission to Allah سبحانه وتعالى مسلمون they're in a state of submission to Allah سبحانه وتعالى but then he says they are also in a state of tasdiq. They're mu'mineen. It's more than just the outward forms of submission. There's an inward assent. Assess, uh, there's an inward assent to that submission that they believe in Allah Subhanahu wa Taala because you can be a Muslim and be a munafiq. But the mu'min, no. This is deeper. And then the people of qunut. Some of the Mufassirun, they say, The people that continue to be in a state of ta'a with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They're continuous in their state. Stand before God in a state of obedience. This is how we want to meet our Lord, in a state of obedience. And then he says, the people of truthfulness. Ya ayyuhalladheena wa kunu sadiqeen Be with truthful people. We're a nation of sitq. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us to be shuhada. Kunu qawwamina bil qist. Shuhada alillahi walau ala anfusikum. Aw al walidain wal aqrabin. Allah says, be people who establish justice. And then He says, be witnesses for the sake of your Lord, for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, even if it means witnessing against yourselves. When you do wrong things, have the courage have the honesty and have the fortitude to say that this is wrong. What I did was wrong. What we did was wrong. What these Muslims did was wrong. We have to have the ability to be truthful, even witnesses against ourselves, our parents, our own relatives. This is Islam. It's a high thing. It's calling you to rise above your nafs, rise above your egos, rise above your caprice, rise above these things, really elevate yourselves. Ta'alu, atru, ma harma rabbukum alik. Allah says ta'alu, which means come, but it also means elevate yourselves. It's from ulu. Come, elevate yourselves and listen to what your Lord has prohibited you to do. Because these things will elevate you. If you avoid them, you will be elevated in the world. You will be elevated. Allah will raise you up. He will raise you up as a community. But you have to be virtuous people. You have to be people of virtue. And then he says the people of sabr. Wa sabirina wa sabirat. We have to be people of patience. There are two fundamental types of patience. You have to sabru ala ta'a wa sabru anil ma'siya. Patience in doing what is right and then patience in avoiding what is wrong. 
because your nafs will be tempted, your lower self will be tempted. So you have to avoid those. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that they're people of khushu'a. This is a very important attribute. Khushu'a is tawadu'a. It is humility. We have to be a humble people. We have to be humble before Allah. Now I want to focus on this for one second. For more than a second. I know I'm almost out of time, but I want to focus on this. We must stop all of this arrogance and sectarianism among some of the community members that we have who only have one way of doing things. One way. There's only one way. My way or the highway. And that's it. My way or the highway. No. We have a religion that is deeply nuanced. It has a broad usul. There are multiple interpretations for many of the rulings of Islam. And beware of arrogating to yourself the role that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given to His self alone. Allah knows His religion. Most of the ishtihadat of our great scholars were done by signing their fatwas with Wallahu a'lam, Wallahu wa rasuluhu a'lam, Allah knows best. In other words, this is the best I can do, but Allah knows best. We have, we have to stop all of this madness where somebody says, Ya khi haram. You can't, that's haram. Is that mujma' alay? Is it agreed upon? Do you, have you studied these books? Have you studied the usul? Because there are some things that the ulama say, there's a difference of opinion. Some of the ulama differ on certain things. And you will have this. You will have opinions of ulama that say, inna al-halal bayyinun, wa inna al-haram bayyinun, wa baynuhuma umurun mushtabihat, la ya'lamuhunna kathirun min al-nas. That the halal is clear, the haram is clear, and between them are gray areas. Many people don't know them. Only the ulama are expertise in these. And we're talking about the giant ulama, not people who have studied and done their Nizami course or done their graduate from uh, four years at a Islamic uh, university. No, some of the teachers I studied with studied for 30 years at the hands of their teachers. 30 years, and they have lifelong learners. Sheikh Abdullah bin Bayya, one of the greatest living scholars today, he studied until he was, uh, he studied from the time he was about four years old until the time he was 21, every day, five to six days a week, 10, 15 hours a day, pure study with his father and the other teachers. He memorized 10 qiraats of Quran. He memorized all of the, the dawaween of the pre-Islamic Arabs. He learned the, all of these uh, texts in Arabic grammar and in, uh, learned the alfiya, the ihmirar, another thousand lines after the alfiya. He studied the kafiya. He studied the Muhtasar Khalil, memorized the whole mashhur of the madhab of Imam Malik. Wallahi, when you see him, with his piety and the way he addresses these issues, Allahu A'lam. I've heard him many times say, Allah knows best. This is the best I can do. And I've, I've asked him about a hadith, he said, it's not in the six collections. This is a level. And then we have people saying, who is Shaykh Abdullah bin Bayyah? Who is he? Who are these, these dwarfs? Really, who are, with no offense to physical dwarfs. I'm talking about intellectual dwarfs. Physical dwarfs, that's not a problem. You know, that's the way Allah created them. But an intellectual dwarf, you created yourself. Allah gave you the ability to expand your mind. If your mind is not expanded, you are to blame. But knowledge comes with patience, comes with learning. They're pushing me off quick, so I'm going to be getting out of here. But really, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, in, wa inna hadhi ummatukum ummatan wahida, wa ana rabbukum fattaqoon, fattaqatta'u amrahum baynahum zubura, kullu hizbin bima ladayhim farihoon. Allah says, your ummah is one ummah, and I am your Lord, so be, have taqwa of me, have taqwa of me. And then he says, but despite that, they divided, they split the, and followed different books. They split, no, our book is the book of Allah and the sunnah of the messenger of Allah, but it is in accordance with valid understandings, not always in agreement but in agreement that each one is valid. And this is the beauty of our religion. It's the power of our religion. So my advice to myself and all of you, we have to be humble towards this faith. May Allah bless all of you, take you back to your homes, uh, safe and sound. May Allah forgive me for anything I might have said. I want to add also, uh, just in, uh, in, in, in conclusion, I think the, 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 
the MSA is one of the most important uh, organizations because we have many young people in college who come and this is a this is the lifeboat because college today in the United States of America is like going to Sodom and Gomorrah in many places it's like going to Sodom and Gomorrah you have uh, you have co-ed dorms now you have co-ed bathrooms in some of the college campuses now for pure equality you see because now there's a whole argument they want to have an argument to let women go topless because they say it's not right the men can walk around topless and a lot of them are so obese now that they have very large breasts so why should the women not be able to go out top these are the arguments that they're making why should they go around uh, not topless pretty soon we're going to have people walking around in g-strings we had naked men in Berkeley walking around naked, bare naked, birthday suit on. And he walked around the city naked until finally somebody worked out an ordinance that there's actually a health issue for him sitting down in public places. And they got him, forced him to wear some kind of loincloth, <laughs> Tarzan in Berkeley. This is, the, this is the great American civilization. Man, a long way from Victoria, huh? Queen Victoria. Remember Victorian England? Charles Dickens, huh? Really, Jane Austen? <laughs> what would they think? They'd pull out their hair, pass out on the street, have a heart attack. I'm serious. If they walked out in Georgetown today or down here in Washington, D.C. and saw people, first of all, I mean, people have tattoos, you know, of like, they have tattoos of, of demons on their shoulders. I mean, I was behind somebody who had a tattoo of a 1966 Mustang on their back. Like, I, I was... You know, I worked out it was a 66 Mustang because the license plate said 1966 on their back. I know this is tragic for people. This is tragic that this has happened to our society, our civilization. Uh, really. And we're getting Muslims putting on tattoos. We've got young Muslims now putting on tattoos. This is true. We have now these, these uh, in the Arab world, there are entertainers that are starting to wear tattoos. Listen, we have tattoos in Islam. All right? Seriously. But they're temporary. It's called henna. If, if you want to put a tattoo on, just put a temporary one on there. If you're 17 or 18 years old, I want a tattoo. Just put a temporary one on there. It'll wear off by the time your intellect comes back to you. All right? Assalamu alaikum.